conference, can I now welcome Leah Franchetti to speak? Leah is a former teacher and a proud trade unionist. Leah. Thank you, colleagues. I'd like to start today with an unusual statement. I would like to praise Nicola Sturgeon. As a trade unionist and ex-primary teacher, I know the strain that schools have been under. I know the frustration of parents who see huge disparities in outcomes for pupils from pu poorer backgrounds depending on their postcode. I believe it was right for the First Minister to name her top priority as substantially closing the attainment gap. However, that will be the last time I praise the SNP government. Inequality in our school system has been widening for years now. Instead of focusing on education from day one of an SNP government, it took the nationalists nearly eight years to rethink their priorities. The constitution and independence came first. The education of our children was a distant afterthought. We should be extremely disappointed with John Swinney's reform agenda. His governance review serves one purpose only. It undermines our councils and gives his government control over education and removes local democratic accountability. You've seen the disaster of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority, whose toothless board members are handpicked by the Justice Secretary. Imagine what it would be like if John Swinney's cronies became the beneficiaries of his educational power grab. He also wanted to import Teach First into the Scottish education system. I appreciate this fast track scheme has its admirers, but no self-respecting profession would accept that the solution to staff shortages would be to reduce the training and supervision time for new entrants. I'm all for change but not any change. It has to be change for the better. The reforms John Sweeney should be pursuing are obvious. He should be reversing the cuts his government has implemented. He should be supporting teachers with a real terms pay rise that recognises their hard work in the classroom. He should offer training bursaries for all student teachers. And he should see councils as partners, not enemies. And he should stop tinkering at the edges and abandon an irrelevant set of policies that will do little to reduce the attainment gap. And there is a broader reason why the SNP government will not close the attainment gap substantially or otherwise. The SNP is a nationalist party, not a social justice movement. SNP MSPs do not wake up with a burning sense of injustice about inequality. They rise every morning with a burning sense of anger about being in a political union with England. Their passion is constitutional, not social, economic or educational. Labour says education, education, education. The SNP say grievance, grievance, grievance. Colleagues, this government's muddled sense of priorities can be seen in other areas of education. As we all know, further education has been a lifeline for working class women and men over the years. Alongside the trade union movement, FE has been a bridge which has given people their second and third chances in life. However, this SNP government has slashed funding for colleges whilst protecting universities and they have cut grants for students in need while maintaining so-called free higher education, which still tethers our poorest young people with more debt than in the past, regardless of whatever meme is doing the rounds this week. Nicola Sturgeon has protected the castle but pulled up the drawbridge. She has bribed middle Scotland and pickpocketed the poor. Don't get me wrong, this SNP government aren't as bad as the Tories. Down south, we have the disaster of free schools, unqualified teachers, 
and the appalling spectacle of profit-making bodies eyeing education budgets. John Swinney hasn't gone down this road yet, but he looks set to implement Tory-like policies in Scotland with the help of Ruth Davidson's MSPs. Surely we can do better than simply not being as bad as the Tories. That's why we need a social justice advocate leading the government, not a constitutional obsessive who has taken her eye off the ball. That's why we need Richard Leonard in Butte House. We need Ian Gray as Cabinet Secretary for Education, challenging vested interests, reversing the cuts, building up public services, implementing real change. It's time for a real Labour government at Holyrood. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Can I now invite Ian Gray, MSP, Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education, Skills and Science, to open the debate. Ian. Well, thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thank you to Leah for those uh, introductory remarks. Conference, I read in the press that we were coming to Dundee to conference to rediscover our roots, and it surprised me a little because the Labour Party I have been a member of for almost 40 years has never forgotten our roots and the power of education, skills and human inventiveness to shape our world and to change society for the better has always been the strongest strand of those roots. So it is that Labour's record in power, whether in municipality or in government is a record of progress in education and one to be proud of. It was Labour who abolished the divisive 11 plus system in our schools, a system which saw 75% of pupils leave school with not a single qualification. It was Labour who opened up our universities beyond the tiniest of elites and even through the work of Jenny Lee, created an open university, genuinely open to all, so that where less than 5% of young people went to university in the 1950s, now almost half have that opportunity. And conference, it was even Labour in Scotland who abolished tuition fees in our universities way back in 2001, whatever the SNP might try to tell you. And that is the truth, however much Twitter time they spend trying to rewrite history, or how many stones they use to inscribe their own alternative facts. But it's no wonder that the SNP are reduced to claiming credit for things that Labour did in education, because their own record is a dismal one, one to be ashamed of. Not only did they not abolish tuition fees, they have come close to abolishing grants and bursaries instead. Not only did they not abolish student debt as they promised, they have doubled debt for Scottish students. You know, the SNP's student loan book is now that Scottish Government's single biggest financial asset, currently worth four and a half billion pounds. That's three times the value of the Queen's Ferry Crossing. And in colleges, they have cut 140,000 students out of those opportunities which Leah spoke to us about a moment ago. And in our schools, they have achieved something quite astonishing. They have cut 4,000 core teaching jobs from our schools and still managed to create a teacher recruitment crisis at the same time. And the SNP's answer to all of these problems is to press ahead with their reforms. Reforms which are rejected by parents, rejected by teachers, 
rejected by educationalists, rejected by their own education advisors, and even rejected by some of their own SNP councils. And John Swinney talks the language of empowering schools when he describes these reforms. But we are not fooled. These reforms are really about attacking and disempowering our councils and centralising control of our schools with the very government who have so badly mismanaged those schools for 11 long years. This is just the latest SNP assault on local democracy, on the right for us to take local decisions about our local schools. And that is not what our schools need. We know what our schools need. They need enough teachers, fully trained and qualified, properly paid, with enough support staff and enough resources to do the job our children need them to do. Conference, that is why Scottish Labour supports the Teachers Value Education, Value Teachers campaign. <laughs> the truth is that under the SNP, in 10 years, our teachers have gone from some of the best paid teachers in the developed world to some of the most poorly paid and overworked teachers anywhere in Western Europe. That is why we support a pay deal for teachers which restores the value of salaries, which makes that profession attractive again, and which is fully funded by the Scottish Government, not our hard-pressed councils. You know, the Tories and their cheerleaders in the press try to characterise the educational workforce as a block on educational progress, a self-interested blob, they sneer. Conference, the truth is, a fully trained, fully qualified, properly remunerated and valued teaching profession has been the absolute cornerstone of all the progress our schools have made over the decades and they should not have to take industrial action to have that acknowledged. <laughs> but conference, if they do, we will stand with them. Just as we stood with college lecturers last year fighting for the fair pay they had been promised. And just as we stand right now with the UCU lecturers fighting to protect their pensions. <clears throat> These are the teachers and lecturers. We need to inspire, empower, and equip our children and grandchildren for their future. If you really care about education, then you care about the educators too. They need Labour support and solidarity now, and they shall have it in Holyrood, in our communities, and if need be, on their picket lines. Because to support our teachers and our lecturers is to support our children and grandchildren's future and to honour the roots of this proud Labour movement. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ian, and um, for all the work that you're doing on our behalf in uh, Holyrood there. Just a very quick word here, delegates. You're getting the hang of this, um, how, how we come up and, and, and speak, particularly the, the new delegates that, that are here. But do you know, yesterday there was a couple of um, people that were up speaking who told me that, okay, I know you've got a traffic light system, but we couldn't see the lights anywhere. 
Now, I'm sure they were telling me the truth, because this is the Labour Party, and they wouldn't do anything nasty like, you know, telling tales to the, the, the chair, I'm sure. So, for the avoidance of doubt, when you're up here speaking, the traffic lights are on this screen in front of me here, and they will be at green when you're okay for time. When you're getting towards the end, it will turn to amber, and towards the end of the end, it will turn to flashing and then to red. And we do need to stick to the times there. So I ask for your, your cooperation with that. I'm going to ask the, the people who are moving and seconding composite motion 2, contemporary motion 10 and contemporary motion 11 to come to the side here and to be ready to come up as necessary. And please, again, stop being so polite, waiting for other people to come off first. Let's try and keep it moving and we can just grab an extra two or three minutes and hopefully get another couple of speakers in over the course of the morning. So please, could I ask a uh, contemporary motion two submitted by Dundee City Labour Party and Edinburgh Central CLP. Could the mover now come forward and uh, present the motion? Thank you. Vijay Jackson, Edinburgh Central COP. Comrades, you may be wondering why someone from my age is up to talk about pensions, an issue that won't affect us for another 50 years, assuming we'll be able to afford to retire at all, or our homes haven't been flooded by melting ice caps. After all, the papers would have us believe we'd easily be able to save enough to live on in old age if we didn't buy so many avocados. The point is, everyone is entitled to have a retirement with a comfortable standard of living. This latest attack on the university superannuation scheme by Universities UK by trying to move staff from a defined benefit scheme to a defined contribution scheme, paying more and getting less, <coughs> while being at the mercy of market machinations, is simply the newest front on not only public sector pensions, but on the government's drive to destroy the education system as we know it. The Tories are trying to marketise education and make it into a commodity to be bought and sold, rather than a public good provided for the benefit of all society. We can see it in the trebling of tuition fees, in the academisation of schools, in the casualisation of staff contracts. An attack on staff is an attack on students. Their working conditions are our learning conditions. But when they say cut back, we say fight back. Over 60 universities are on strike across the UK, including nine in Scotland. If you've ever been a part of the student movement since 2010, then you know what student staff solidarity looks like. Trade unions like UCU marching alongside us on national demos, helping us organize coaches, defending campus protesters from victimization by management. UCU are right to not call off the strike while you UK are at the negotiating table because you lose your momentum and weaken your hands. Look at what happened to the junior doctor strike. Now, it's time to repay their solidarity by helping them win this strike and not settling for a penny less. Already, students have gone into occupation at Sussex, Leicester, UCL, Bath, Bristol, Exeter, Reading, Liverpool and Southampton. Our class interests are one and the same. However, university managers are shamelessly trying to pit us against each other. They say, how can we afford to abolish fees for all students? Not just the half-hearted version by the SNP, funding higher education fees for some at the expense of cutting over 150,000 further education places? How can we afford fair pay and pension stuff? How can we afford universal living grants so students like me aren't condemned to a lifetime of debt? <laughs> Roughly 81,000 pounds, if you're wondering. <laughs> We should have absolutely no time for the bullshit intergenerational arguments of students versus staff, millennials versus baby boomers. It's about the working class against the rich and powerful, against the capitalist class. We didn't start this struggle, but we will end it. The money exists to pay for both free education and for a decent retirement for all. In the profits of banks who we bailed out, in multinational corporations who dodge their taxes, in the fat cat salaries of vice chancellors. We can only do this by the rank and file democratization of our educational institutions and by fighting for Labour's vision of a national education service. Education that works for people, not for profit. Education is a right, not a privilege. Education which is free, liberated and accessible to all. Our vision is a socialist vision, lifelong, cradle to grave, breaking down the divisions between academic and vocational study, providing childcare and better mental health support. Where are the Tories selling arms to Saudi Arabia for their war in Yemen? What kind of society do we want to live in? One that values killing more than learning? 
our staff cannot subsist on what amounts to a part-time pension. You don't eat part-time, pay rent part-time, exist part-time. This is the point where we turn the tide on marketization and the decimation of pensions across the economy. We define, define benefits here and then fight to extend them back to all workers. If not now, when? If not us, then who? Labour is the party of our class. We need to defend the wages and conditions of all workers. We are long past the age of equivocation on industrial action. We need to send a clear message. We support every worker in every struggle. Conference, support this motion. Labour backs the strike. Seconder, please. <clears throat> Marion Spuring, Dundee Labour Party and member of the University and College Union. On Thursday, on International Women's Day, I stood alongside my colleagues here at the University of Dundee and students on the picket line the ninth day in a strike which so far has lasted for three weeks instead of doing my job alongside colleagues because we were not alone. We stood with colleagues in picket lines across the universities in Scotland and in the United Kingdom, in all corners, from London to Aberdeen to Cardiff to Belfast, the Open University and Dundee, too many to mention. Our dispute with the employers' organization, Universities UK, is not over. Next week, we are starting a full week of strikes. This is the biggest university strike in the UK we have ever seen. Instead of teaching, researching, looking after IT systems, libraries, student services, recruitment, dealing with the vast array of tasks which staff usually deal with, we have been braving snow, ice, and rain, and everything the weather has thrown at us to make our stance clear. We actually suspected that universities in the UK had conspired with the weather gods to keep us off the picket line, but they did not manage to do that. It did not work. Our stance is clear, and we know that we have the support of the labor movement, of the public, and most importantly, the students. But the employers do not listen to us. The students have been standing with us because, and the members of the public, the Labour Party, because everybody can relate to the importance of having a decent and fair pension to be able to retire in dignity, not poverty. Cutting £10,000 a year in retirement of the pension is an outrage. One of my students wrote in support, I know that we will win this together because we cannot afford to lose. We have not yet won. Talks with Acres are ongoing. We got the employers back to the negotiating table, demonstrating that industrial action had an effect. But we need to keep the pressure up, and the exam period after Easter might be affected. The employers need to listen to our concerns. It's not just a fight for our pensions in the university sector, but for the right for pensions in all sectors for all workers. I would like to finish with some words based on the word of the author Wolfgang Borchert, and I'll do that very quickly, I see the light. When they come and tell us that there is a deficit in your pension scheme and you need to pay more but get less when you retire, say no. When they come and tell you that your students will suffer and that it is your fault because you're on strike, say no. When they come and tell you that there's no money and we have to rely on the performance of the stock market, just say no. When they come and tell you that universities are businesses and that your students have to pay for their education, say no, because, because if you don't say no and fight back and stand in solidarity, we will all lose. In this spirit, I'll ask conference to support the motion. Thank you. There's the cheering because it was a good speech. I'm also cheering because she noticed the, the lights there. So keep up the good work, comrades. Um, conference will now consider contemporary motion 10 on local access officers submitted by Hamilton Lark Hall and Stonehouse CLP. Can we move it, please speak? 
Hi, I'm Susanna Murnan from Hamilton Lackall and Stonehouse. The conference recognises that students with additional support needs or on the autistic spectrum can find it really difficult and daunting to make the transition from secondary school to further education. The change in surrounding and location, additional travelling, different personnel and peer groups can be difficult to cope with all at once. This can prevent a young person from pursuing further education even when they have the academic ability or cause early dropouts due to the lack of adequate support in further education establishments. This is a crucial time in a young person's life and reducing the multiples of changes for students on the autistic spectrum or with additional needs would reduce the stress and anxiety of the situation. Conference believes that appointing local access officers in secondary schools to work with the students, the school and further education providers to identify courses and entry requirements and arrange phased introduction to local establishments would reduce these multiple changes. They could assist students to identify local opportunities for further study while living at home and so avoiding excessive travelling and living costs which are a major inhibiting factor for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. The SNP government's abolition of travel grants has greatly exacerbated this problem. Conference applauds the work of charities on such issues as highlighted by Enable in February 2018, but believes that state provision is also crucial. Conference therefore calls on the SEC to consider seriously a policy of appointing such local access officers to the staff of secondary schools. Thanks. Good morning. Elna Haggett, Unison, seconding contemporary motion 10. Conference. Unison members are clear that currently we are not getting it right for children with additional support needs. To be frank, this isn't because the policy is failing, and I know that for a fact because I'm a housing manager that works with additional support needs. There are some great strategies and policy commitments to support children with additional support needs. However, the problem is these have not been matched with funding to enable their implementation. There is not enough cash to support recruitment, training and support for the staff in order to ensure that they can deliver the correct support. Parents often have to fight to get additional support needs recognised and when those parents, that's the ones that are able to fight these battles, win that fight, there is no additional funding attached to implement the decision. This, therefore, has an impact on provision of services for other children relying on that budget, which is more often or not left to our early years workers, support workers, classroom assistants and pupil support assistants. Since 2010, the number of pupils with additional support needs has doubled, but there are 1,841 fewer support staff in local authorities. Getting it right for every child with additional support needs cannot be done on the cheap. There needs to be more staff and better training and professional development for all staff, not just teachers. We are in no way hostile to the idea of more specialist support for these pupils making their way into further education. We do have concerns, though, that we could end up with another fantastic piece of legislation containing great commitments that the Scottish Government will trumpet as being world leading, that then isn't resourced. Conference, it's easy to see how appointing local access officers could make a difference for the better. But that difference can only be made if it means someone has the time and training to make it happen. If it's just something else that's added to someone's job description, it won't do anybody any good. Conference, getting it right for every child can't be done on the cheap. Let's resolve to get it right. That means more than a resolution or a policy or even a piece of legislation. It means a budget decision to make it happen. Conference, please support. Can I just get an indication of anyone who's interested in, in speaking just now? Chris? Joanne, if you'd like to make your way across just now, and I'll try and bring in others if I can. Please, sir. Um, uh, we're considering contemporary motion 11 on early learning, submitted by the Socialist Education Association. 
Thank you, Chair. A good morning, Conference. Bill Butler, Chair of the Socialist Educational Association of Scotland, moving contemporary motion 11 and calling the SNP to account on their underfunding of Scotland's early learning and care. When the inspectors looked at the record of the SNP in their recent report, they flagged up significant risks in the way the SNP was trying to operate the policy of increasing hours in the early years. The report included warnings such as no measures of success being present, a lack of agreed evidence for benefit to children and parents, and no attempt to look at other ways to reach the targets. The SNP's empty boasts were further highlighted by uh, the inspectors when they surveyed parents. Parents said the changes had a limited impact on their ability to get to work. The auditor's report included the value the SNP government places on increasing hours of early learning. Councils know it's going to take at least another billion pounds, but the SNP were only prepared to offer 840 million. It seems like the SNP only value the uh, early learning in terms of 84 pence for every pound needed. That's a pity because our last manifesto was fully costed. It seems that the SNP should be following Labour's example here. But again, that's the SNP's record. They talk big and do very little indeed. <laughs> Scottish Labour will invest in the quality of early learning and care. The SEA Scotland would like to see our early learning and care be among the world's best. We all would. We want to see an inclusive, comprehensive, wraparound model of education, care and health for our children and their parents and carers. It's not just the number of hours, it's the high quality which is vital and the funding that enables that high quality to be delivered. We also need to have an emphasis on purposeful play. The latest research on the developing brains of our children makes the connection between challenging and enjoyable learning leading to high quality outcomes. We want to be able to offer child-centred pathways through early learning that can mean children starting school at a later age. Now, while the quality of learning is vital, the quality of teaching and leading learning is crucial. Our aspiration for high quality learning and care at the early ages will achieve, be achieved by continued improvement in the quality of staff, by enhanced training opportunities, and by investment in the pay of our educators and teachers at the early stages and throughout the educational system, and solidarity with UCU and with the EIS in that vein. Our sense of our society can be measured by the value we place on public sector workers. But in the 10 years that the SNP have been mismanaging Scotland, we have seen our teachers become the third worst off across 20 OECD countries. The SNP undervalues and underfunds early year services and undervalues and underpays our teachers and educators. Labour will review teachers' pay. Labour will make sure that teachers are valued and paid the rate for the job at all stages of learning. Colleagues, good education goes hand in hand with the creation of a society where wealth, power and influence are shared equally, where the needs of the many outweigh the greed of the few. A well-funded progressive system of lifelong education lies at the heart of the nurturing of the talents and the fulfilment of the potential of all of our people. It is a fundamental to realise the society where decent jobs and good wages, alongside decent housing and good health services, are guaranteed by accountable government. The only way to achieve that goal is to redouble our efforts to get Labour back into power here in Scotland and across the UK. It is the prerequisite of real change. Move the motion. Is that formally seconded from the floor? Thank you. Okay, first of our speakers. Conference, Chris Costello, Airdrie and Shot, CLP. I was eager to speak in today's debate because as a student, like many here, I've seen and experienced the SNP's mismanagement of our education system. In recent weeks, I've seen lecturers reluctantly tell students that they have to go on strike for a lengthy period of time due to the threats that they're facing to their pensions. Unfortunately, in these same classes, I've seen students complain to the lecturers, not knowing that this isn't the lecturer's fault, but instead it's the brutal reality of a Tory government. In recent weeks, I've been encouraged by seeing Scottish Labour representatives joining the picket line 
and by seeing fellow students stand side by side with their lecturers, telling them that they're not alone in the fight against any Tory-led government to the Tory-led downgrading their pension schemes. Conference, despite university tuition being free thanks to previous Labour government, under the SNP, being a university student is more expensive now than it ever has been before. If I was to continue taking out the student loan that I do today, I will leave university with at least £10,000 worth of debt. To a lot of the fellow students that I go, I go to university with, that's not a lot. They'll be leaving with a lot more. In my constituency of Adrian Schotts, this potential debt means that many people don't actually bother applying. Now, it's easy to say that we should all just go and get a job. However, for young people, there's not, there's not many jobs where there's decent, there's decent work, working conditions. Not only that, when we do get jobs, the cost of our, the cost of, uh, our, university, uh, sorry, our university fees that uh, really comes through books, etc., is so, is so much higher than it, than it should be. This is an absolutely appalling fact, and it's one that the SNP should be ashamed of. But I don't think they are, because as long as we know, it's just not as bad as England. It is more than clear that the SNP are not willing to prioritise those being educated in colleges and universities across Scotland, and it is clear that the Tories are not willing to prioritise the people that are educating us. It is clear that Scottish Labour are the only party who are willing to do both. This situation should never have got to the stage that it's got to. Lecturers should have been listened to from the very beginning. However, it's, it's, it's turned out to be, to be that industrial action is the only way that lecturers will have their voices heard. This industrial action has seen two groups, lecturers and students, who normally might argue over essays, deadlines and exams, but they've found a common ground, standing beside each other to fight to protect, lecturer, to protect the pensions of lecturers. The industrial action has showed us all that the SNP and Tories are so busy fighting with each other over the Constitution that they forgot the real issues of today. Meanwhile, Scottish Labour are getting on with the job that really matters to working people and standing with their lecturers on university ticket lines. It is Scottish Labour who, are, who, who have been continuing to stand with their lecturers and their students. It is Scottish Labour who has reiterated the fact that education should be a public right, a public right that should be based on our ability to learn, not our ability to pay. I would like to see Richard Leonard joining lecturers outside the gates of Glasgow University and proud to see so many Labour representatives across Scotland standing with our educators. It is Labour who stood up for the workers, stood up for the students, will ensure workers entitled to a decent retirement and have encouraged those bodies to get back round the table to ensure a fair deal for our lecturers. Comrades, our lecturers need a Scottish Labour government. Our students need a Scottish Labour government. Our education system only works properly when it is Labour who are in control. Let us come together behind three of our key principles, socialism, solidarity and equality. Let us be the force that elects a Scottish Labour government, a government that will create an education system that works for the many, not the few. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Joanne Lamont, proud to be Labour and Cooperative MSP for Glasgow. I thought I was scary in the chair, um, so I'll make sure I have to behave myself for you. We cannot overstate the importance of education as our mission to create a fairer world. Our movement was built by those who are often self-taught and for whom the Labour movement, the trade union movement, the cooperative movement was their school, was their university, and their opportunity to achieve their potential. You know, it's no surprise that the first subscription library in the British Isles was Leadhill's Miners Library, established in 1741 by miners who understood the power of education. We understand the power of education to liberate, they knew then, and we know now, 
that to change the world, you have to understand it first. We need to reassert our commitment to a belief in lifelong learning, proper investment in our children at the very earliest stages in their lives, but also investment in those adults failed by the system when they were at school, allowing people a second chance, a third chance, building on the work of our colleges, not attacking those colleges that were serving the people of our communities. But we also know that education can't be fad and fashion, a search for headlines or lines to take, the lines to take that we hear too often in the Parliament. It has to be the heavy lifting, an understanding of how the system operates and how we need to build on the things that work to transform lives. We are in the business of investing in education, not sloganising about education. For the test for us is always this. Does our education system challenge inequality or does it reinforce inequality? And I regret to say that now in 2018, too often our system is not allowed to liberate our young people and it is denying them the opportunities that they deserve. There are wonderful things being done by teachers, our support staff, in community learning, by all those who have a passion to, to take education forward. But we know it's being made more difficult by the choices by being made by this government. I make a particular plea for an understanding of our school communities in supporting young people, all of those who work in school, the teachers and the support staff. But I regret what is currently happening in those schools. Now, some will tell you it's political knockabout to talk about the budget and funding of local government. But the reality is that cuts to local government are meaning teachers overstretched, a lack of the support staff who can support young people, who can reach into families and work with those families that need a bit more support, and denying young people the opportunity to learn. This is short-sighted and profoundly unjust. Of course, we should talk about widening access, but currently it's an abdication of responsibility to do what is happening now to our young people, denying them even the opportunity to think about university later in the system because they're falling out of it when they're only young. There are young people with additional support needs who are maybe getting half a day in school and that is defined as full-time education. There are young people who need support to access education who are being denied it. And there are teachers, passionate about their ability to unlock the potential of our young people, to create a curiosity, to see them achieving their talent, are being denied their life's mission to support education by decisions that are made about budgeting now. When we are in government, we will again assert the importance of education at every stage in our lives. It is not easy, but it is the way in which we tackle inequality and change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And can I now ask Mary Fee, MSP, Shadow Minister for Education and Skills, to close the debate. Mary. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, conference. Can I begin by thanking those who have submitted motions on education and reaffirm my support to the UC, UCU university staff, including lecturers, librarians, and research assistants who are currently striking to protect their pensions from the proposed arbitrary and unfair changes. And as the Chair said in introducing me, I am Scottish Labour spokesperson for education, skills, health, sport and equalities. And it's my belief that equality should run through every single portfolio in Parliament. And I am delighted to ensure that that focus is at the heart of everything that Scottish Labour does in the Parliament. And we know that investing in education brings about the best in people and creates new opportunities for all. 
Unfortunately, as we all know, under this SNP government, education has been underfunded, and it is the children of the last decade who have suffered. The attainment gap has continued to grow, despite the First Minister's pledge to make education her top priority. She fails to recognise that cutting over 4,000 teachers and support staff only damages the efforts that are made to support all of our pupils to thrive in the classroom. And as important as they are, literacy and numeracy shouldn't be the sole focus of education. We need to place health and well-being on a level playing field. Only then can we offer every single child the same opportunities, regardless of their background or their wealth. Children who go to school hungry or are refused additional support or mental health services will not flourish in school. And we know that in the more deprived communities, these issues are far more prevalent. And the link between deprivation and underperformance is clear. And we need to bring together every single area of government to ensure that we create the right environment for children to thrive. And the key to improving the health and well-being of children starts with real change in our economy. And under Richard Leonard, that's what Scottish Labour is offering. Conference. The policy papers ask the Scottish Policy Forum to consider a range of education issues. And I'm delighted that childcare has been placed at the top of those challenges. Only a flexible, all-age, all-year-round wrap wraparound system that is affordable will do for Scottish Labour. I would ask you to support Contemporary Motion 11 in the name of the Socialist Education Association on childcare. It is right that more free hours of nursery education are offered, especially to, to help those from the most deprived backgrounds. However, to get women back to work, this offer must be provided at an earlier age. And I would call on the policy forum to work with the parliamentary education team to see how we can deliver the best and the most affordable childcare in the UK. Conference, colleges and universities are crucial, crucial establishments in upskilling and educating our country to attract the best jobs and to create an economy that works for the many. Sadly, the Scottish National Party has decided that for a decade, it's colleges that would bear the brunt of their cuts in education, with over 140,000 fewer students in our, in our colleges. And that reduction disproportionately affects women and older students. Ensuring that those who want to study can is essential, and ensuring that the financial support is there is crucial. Unfortunately, the SNP believe that if you are from a poorer background, then gaining more debt through student loans is the only way for you. Cutting bursaries cuts opportunity, opportunities that many from deprived backgrounds cannot afford to miss. In conference, in coming to a close, I want to repeat the comments of Ian Gray in his opening remarks where he said that we support a pay deal for teachers which restores the value of salaries, makes the profession attractive and which is fully funded by the Scottish Government. We all know that a fully trained and fully qualified, properly remunerated and valued teaching profession has been central to the progress of our schools throughout the decades. Our teachers should not have to resort to industrial action to have that recognised. However, if our teachers do resort to industrial action to receive the fair pay deal for their work that they deserve, then they will, as they always have done, our full support. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mary, and thanks to all contributors to this debate.